thank you for everyone for, for coming to join us this evening. Um, um, I'm Mark French. I'm acting as the, the Dean of NMES at the moment. Um, and uh, yeah, I really think it's, a, it's really great to get these inaugural lectures um, uh, going again. It was something that I was very keen uh, to see happen. Um, so we've got, I think, five of these um, over, the next, over the next year. And, you know, the key thing about them is that they're, you know, it's normal academic activity where we're post-pandemic. It's great to see these normal, normal things happening again. Um, and, you know, but, you know, we're in a different world now. So, um, you know, it's great that we have, I think, 65 people somewhere in the ether um, online also watching this event. So welcome to those, uh, those as well. Um, but, yeah, great for everyone to be here. Now, um, we've got two inaugural lectures today. Um, they're, they're, they're academic uh, things. They're going to talk about uh, what they've been doing, um, what motivates them, and, and what their research is, but also something about the journey and how they, and how they got there. So I hope that we get a, a good uh, sense of, of what it means to be a, a, a professor coming forward uh, now. Um, so I think... One of the uh, really interesting things about uh, um, Kings is that there are many people who have joined relatively recently. I I'm one of them. Uh, Luke uh, Moreau is the head of um, informatics. Relatively new. We're not people who've been here um, since we were kind of this high. And that's true for, for uh, Carmine and Elena as well, joined in 2019 and 2020. So there's an important thing about, um, uh, you know, telling the story about uh, what they do, where they came from here as well. So it's a really great pleasure uh, to uh, invite both Carmine and Elena uh, to talk uh, today. Um, and um, Elena said, say something nice, right? So I've, I'm brief to say something nice about Elena and Carmine. So there we go. I'm saying something nice for you, uh, Elena. Uh, you're a great person in Carmine, also a fantastic person. Um, but I won't say any more than that. Let's move on to the, let's move on to the, the main business. So I'd like to invite uh, Carmine uh, up to uh, give his uh, presentation. Computer Science Meets Money, Algorithms for Financial Markets. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, wow, it's, yeah, it's good attendance. Okay, so I, I want to start by saying that I didn't come up with this title. So my initial version of the title was very technical and I was pushed back. And then what I did, I used ChatGBT for suggestion and he came up with this title, not exactly, all right? So I, I, there is a bit of my input. And then the obvious next thing to do after you've used ChatGPT for the title and the abstract, by the way, is to ask uh, how he would, it would uh, structure a presentation. Now, this was a very long answer, uh, but you can see that it's saying that I should uh, make it, uh, I should adapt it and customize it to my own uh, specific research interest. So what I did, I just took the introduction bit, and that's more or less what I'm gonna do. So I'll introduce myself, and in, doing, in introducing myself, and I'm going way back. In introducing myself from uh, early on, I'll, I'll discuss what, what my curiosity and uh, interest were and how this reflected then in my uh, research. I will explain very little about exactly what my research is, perhaps, and uh, I will just um, skim through the importance uh, because in 25 minutes, uh, I think that's all you can do. Okay, so that's, we are ready to go. We, we've used uh, the latest AI tool, so we can go, I can start introducing myself. So as a, as a way of background, I grew up in the 80s in a town in the south of Italy. Uh, does this thing work? I don't know whether, whether we have a pointer, but it's in between the pizza. Do you see the pizza? No, okay, yeah. Between the pizza and this bottle down here, it's, which is Limoncello on the Amalfi Coast. So, you know, I could spend the whole 25 minutes going through this foodie map of Italy, but I won't go, I won't, I'm not going to be doing that. And the town I grew up in is that one. That's a picture taken not from a drone, because in the 80s we didn't have drones. And what was I uh, exposed to uh, when I was growing up in the 80s was many things. Pizzas, food, 
football, and you can see me with an Italian shirt. I think I was about around 10 years old here, or uh, something like that. So what I had, I was clearly very nerdy, and the time was right because we had computers, the first personal computers, some computers, and you can see in the middle there, it's what's known as a Commodore 64. And on the left, the CNAO and the O, you can see a couple of games I liked. But I was so nerd that I wasn't just playing games. I did have my Commodore 64, but I was also start looking at code for some reason, okay? So one uh, month, I took a church, camp, church coding camp, just to tell you what the kind of guy I was, right? So that was my passion. I thought, this is what I'm gonna do. And now I'm joining the dots a bit, okay? But in retrospect, I hated going to street markets with my mom, okay? I mean, walking there was hell for me. But once I got to the market, I think I was, no, I'm sure I was fascinated. People shouting, negotiation, you know, how do you come with price? How do you try to choose the product? From whom should I buy the, the apples? So there was this fascination about this, the social aspects around market that was with me a bit. So now this dichotomy between a very nerdy computer science subject or computer uh, stuff and this more social aspect was with me to the point that when I needed to choose in the 90s what secondary school or high school I needed to attend, for a series of fort or fortunate or unfortunate event, I went in this building here. Now, it wasn't as nice, okay? So they, they made it up, but yeah, good. I mean, they spent money. Uh, and I, I started a, a, an experimental program that was called, uh, in Italian, Ragioniere Programmatore, but it doesn't mean, it doesn't, uh, what it means is something that's in between accounting and software development. I don't know how these guys came up with it, but they thought maybe Excel could be useful, I think. I mean, it wasn't even Excel, it was Lotus 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay, so what this gave me, I think it gave me a more holistic and 360 degree um, vision to, to the world, right? So I saw, because I was exposed to microeconomics, I had the topic which is called sciences of finance. It was all very high level, no maths, no formulas, uh, but it showed me how, you know, policy, for example, can affect people's lives and uh, um, things like that. I had a bit of computer science, so I could still, you know, uh, I, you know give food to that uh, nerd part of, of myself. Okay, so I'm still in between these two uh, streets, if you like. Uh, they, they, they met a bit with this uh, accounting and software development, but you know, I still didn't know what I wanted to do. When it was the time to go to uni, you know, I went back and forth between the two subjects being, let's say, computer science and finance for a long time. And eventually, I decided to go for computer science, okay? So this is me before I started. So when I started, young and uh, thin. Uh, so I was very lucky because I went to the university, this nice leafy campus, which was not far from where I lived. And the luck was that it was full of young faculties with PhDs from the US, okay? So the program was vibrant. The, the location was, was nice. I had fantastic friends and maybe the nerd uh, in me found its place. And what I did in those years, and I think uh, it's very important, I started to see what the giants of the field that produced, okay? So I started studying on all these fantastic books. I mean, this is just an, some examples. And I understood calculus for the first time. I still remember in, year, in the first year when I got, when I understood the first proof, which was a very basic one, but it was really like a, an enlightening moment. Okay, so, you know, now I had proper mathematics, proper programming, uh, I, you know, I was all pumped up. What do you do next? And this was again a, a moment of choice. And uh, I decided to go with uh, Pino Persiano here on the left because he was the one professor who made me work the harder. So with him, I spent nights working on his assignments. So I said, you know, maybe 
that's a good thing to do. And this is when we have a, a full circle number one, because when I went to him for a PhD, he had this uh, European project where you can see at the bottom there, the approach was that they wanted to pursue and they needed staff or they needed, they needed someone to work on it, was multidisciplinary using computer science, economics, amongst other things, okay? Why there was the need for that? And again, you know, now the, the, two, the two streams kind of join, right? So if you remember the computer markets example, this is the first case in which they come back. And why did this, why the project was there? Because in the meantime, whilst I was studying all this on these American books, etc., Google had created a digital marketplace, okay? So the, the, the growth of Google and the internet, it was already ubiquitous enough for it to uh, create a marketplace online. And now the example I'm using here, it's for example, what uh, Google does many times in, in a day, not just Google, but uh, many of, of them, it's selling space on the web. Okay, so for example, if you Google Coca-Cola, you'll get the sponsored results on where you can buy Coca-Cola. What sponsored mean, uh, and again, I don't know where this point, anyway, you see that there is sponsored there. What sponsored mean? It means that these different websites are paying Google to appear on that uh, page in the website, in that part of the uh, web page, okay? Now, if you looked at computer science before the advent of, of Google, what you would have gotten is simply, this is a simple problem. I have some numbers that tell me how much each of these advertisers want to, to pay, and I'll just allocate the ones that give me the highest revenue, for example, right? So this is a simple, I can sort these numbers and choose the top ones. What is now the problem is that I do not know these numbers. I mean, this is Ocado's private information. This is uh, Motatus, I don't know what this is, but Motatus pri private information. So I need now to come up with an algorithms that also takes into account the incentives of these players, okay? So this can be modeled with a, you know, a problem whereby you have slots to allocate and most prominent slots get more of the business and this becomes now a wholesome problem. It's not just a technological problem, it's also about incentives and engineer incentives. So then this is when the first pillar of my research started to, to develop, which is engineering incentives, okay? So by the way, this is a Greek temple not far from where I grew up as well. So, and this is where other nice food, uh, they produce other nice food, but I'll just, uh, I'll just skip that. Okay, so to introduce what I've been doing on incent incentive engineering, I wanna make the setting even simpler than the sponsor search auction setting of you know, the Coca-Cola thing, and just try to sell you this banana stuck on the wall, okay? So I wanna auction the banana stuck on the wall. And if you think about it, so I'm the auctioneer, I need to define the format of the auction. So how, how will I go about collecting from you how much you, for you the banana stuck on the wall is worth? And after I've collected information, I should decide who gets the banana and how much they pay for it, okay? So here is two different solutions. The one on the left, I ask everyone to write on, you know, on a cardboard, on a piece of paper, how much they, they're willing to pay for the banana. So on the left, we have A, B, and C bidding 210, 280, 250. And on the left, what I'll do, I'll give the banana to bidder B, which is who, who is the highest, and I'll charge bidder B 251, which is the second highest bid. This is what's known as second price auction. Uh, there's a Nobel Prize in economics hidden there, okay? I could also do something else, which is what's on the right-hand side, where B is still the winner, but this time B pays what, it, what they said, which is 280. If you want now to make this a bit more uh, concrete, Google went from a variant of the one on the left to a variant of the one on the right, okay? Why did they do that? What's the property and why, which one is better if you want to consider this problem holistically, as we said? So this is the kind of questions I've been uh, studying not just for this simple setting of the banana stuck on the wall, but for many more settings and many more objectives. And one first uh, 
let's say, class of contributions is to try to enlarge the class of problems for which I can engineer incentives as I want by using this observation in economic uh, parlance, with, uh, that, which uh, uh, means that although I do not know the preferences of the bidders, of the people participating to my problem, I can see them act, okay? So I do have hidden preferences, but I do not have hidden actions. So by using the fact that the actions are more or less public, I can enlarge the class of problems I can deal with. The second uh, class of contributions I want to talk about is about whether incentives are easy to, uh, to grasp, okay? So if you look at the second price auction, the one we discussed on the, on the left, where everyone writes their bid at the same time, where, with a different format wherein we do ascending price auction, so the prices keep going up. So there are uh, results in experimental economics showing that people, when they play this kind of, of situations, are, uh, they don't understand the auction on the left, they understand back to the auction on the right, okay? And this is due to some cognitive limitation. So what are in, uh, in this uh, class of research, I'm, in this you know, uh, area of research I'm trying to do, is to understand or characterize what kind of auctions I can run, what kind of situations I can deal with, when for some reasons people make suboptimal choices, okay? And these suboptimal choice, choices could be due to uh, poor um, co cognitive capabilities or because your AI bot is not designed properly. Okay. Okay. So this is the pessimistic view in the sense that here I assume that people are not able enough, are not, you know, let's say rational or uh, clever enough to understand how to play the the game, and they will say they will behave correctly only when it's obvious. So that's why I said this is the pessimistic view. You could also have an optimistic view, wherein you say that the the people will behave unless it's obvious that misbehaving is better for them, okay? And now in one of our recent results that I keep pushing as Willy Wonka auctions, uh, I, I still have, haven't won the approval of my co-authors. One is there, I don't know whether he agrees with me, but what we can prove is that if you use a kind of ticketing system similar to Willy Wonka uh, golden ticket, then the first price auction that Google now uses, the one on the left, actually works. So if you assume that people are not fully rational, fully capable of understanding, and you take the optimistic point of view, then you can use what Google uses, plus the Willy Wonka tickets. Okay, so now we come, this is the incentive engineering uh, I wanted to cover, and I have two more pillars to go through. And I want to uh, mention this uh, turning point was 2016, and this is where I really went full circle. And this is a question that someone asked me, what's the next big thing in finance, okay? Now, my answer wasn't great. And despite that, I was told to teach finance for a number of years, okay? And now, by teaching finance a number of years, I learned a lot, and I went back to my computer science market thing, in, in a more general way. And this is when I get to my second pillar, AI, CS in finance. So again, I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna give a very high uh, bird view. And my motivation here is AI is great, not just to come up with abstracts uh, and title for talks, but also to do many other things. And in finance, we have a lot of needs. The financial industry has a lot of needs uh, of tasks that they need to do better. So on one hand, in finance, the noise to signal ratio in the data, it's, it's very much skewed towards noise. And when we want to use the so-called supervised machine learning techniques, we need to use the data to come up with the labels from which we can learn. But if these labels are noisy, probably we won't be learning very well. The other problem is that in finance, despite the huge wealth of data, data is scarce if you want to use more advanced deep models. So how do we deal with that? And then we have some uh, very um, fi financey stuff. So if you want to use derivatives, and 
in the city, you want to use derivatives, to hedge risk, you need to come up with prices for these derivatives. And this is something that either it's inefficient, takes a lot, lot of time, or uh, requires some assumptions in mathematics that are seldom true in reality. And the last one is you can do the same thing, but instead of pricing these derivatives, you want to hedge the risk of having a certain position against these derivatives. So in our research here, we deal with these four problems. So for the uh, noise to signal ratio, we use AI to denoise financial time series and come up with better financial time series. And there is a quantitative way with which I can say that these ones, these synthetic time series are better. For the uh, problem of scarcity of data, we show that you can use synthetic data generation to train trading algorithms that actually do better than the algorithms trained on real data. This is on the top, you have what an algorithm would do on real, trained on real data. So you see all these arrows, it's taking a lot of positions, which means it's losing money, okay? Instead, you look at the one at the bottom, it's learning to do what's called buy and hold. So you buy Bitcoin because the algorithm figure out that it would go up, and this is much better, okay? For the pricing issue, uh, for the pricing of derivatives, we came up with a, a combination of a new AI pipeline and some um, very cool financial mathematics topics I don't fully understand, but Andrew is here and he does. And we price very well and very quickly. For the hedging problem, we show how to use deep nets to uh, um, trade off the risk and the cost of hedging even when the assumptions that mathematics need are not true. And then there is something that I put in between where we push all the financial data into a new space that we call latent space. And this in latent space, there's a lot of nice structure that we can use. And on the AI in finance, uh, AI CS in finance, I want to conclude with something you might have heard on the news about Credit Suisse and SVB, banks fail. And we have a, a problem as uh, regulators or from the systemic point, systematic, systemic point of view to understand the exposure of banks to this risk of default. And you know, th this is, we can define a very concrete way of measuring this risk. Uh, and unfortunately, the answer that we found in our research is that there is a very precise sense and for, uh, for which it's hard to compute the exposure to systemic risk of these uh, banks. Okay, so this concludes the second pillar. I don't know how I'm, going for, I'm doing what with time. Carl is silent, so I keep going. So the third pillar is on, on market simulation. So for example, this model about systemic risk, very nice, but it's still a theoretical model that's hiding a lot of the, com com the complex issues of the real world. So what we'd like to get is a way in which we can simulate these complex systems, okay? A way in which we can play with some uh, independent variable and compare, for example, the systemic risk when we use regulation one and the systemic risk when we use, re use regulation two. Now, to do that, we need to solve a lot of challenges. One is this, uh, you know, this simulation platform must be scalable uh, uh, because we have many actors in the financial world and this is uh, often computationally out of reach. We need uh, to account for uh, adaptive strategies. So if we change regulations, people come, are going to come up with different strategies. And we need to account for the incentives of these banks or, or these actors. Okay? So finance is extremely uh, strategic. Cool. Three minutes left. I think I'm going to do it. Yeah. Uh, so they, they are uh, highly strate strategic and we'd like to account for strategies or, or actions that are guided by incentives. So the, the way we have approached this, we can't yet solve all these problems. So what we've done is so far only work on the incentive bit and understand how regulations can change what markets look like. For example, if you take the way any uh, or the majority of exchanges work in the, world, in the real world, you use something that's called price time priority, where the strategies that actors or uh, traders use are just about speed and not about quality of strategies. And this leads to flash crashes like the one on the right in 2010 or to uh, a number of different problems. 
So what the proposal we, we've considered is let's slow down the market a bit, but let's slow down only when it's needed. So we use an adaptive clearing. So when the market is under stress, maybe we stop it for a little bit. When the market is doing fine, we keep pushing very quickly in order to move these strategies from speed to actual quality of, um, of, posi of kind of actions taken. And in experimental results, we see that this proposal, and in these graphs, you know, there's a lot, I could talk a lot about these graphs, but these plots, but essentially what we can see is that you don't sacrifice a lot by uh, slowing down the market, and actually some of, this, uh, of the um, other measures are better, okay? So that's, uh, that's the kind of simulation, market simulation result we've got uh, as in, in this example. We also have done uh, another one where, again, you try to change a bit the way the market operates, and then you get some dynamics. So what in this, these triangles mean is this, these are different settings uh, of different things I could do to um, fix the market. And in these triangles, you have how uh, traders will react to the different settings, and uh, you have points where they're called equilibrium points. Anyway, so what you can see then is what the market will look like according to different regulations. On the right there, you have alpha equal one, which is the current proposal. And if you move to the left, you have these different uh, settings that you can play with. And now let's, let's say that you like to have uh, higher volumes and you're fine if the volatility of the market is roughly half of the current situation, then you can discover that the right setting is alpha 0.7. Okay, so this was a very quick and uh, very high level idea of the kind of work I've been doing on these three pillars. And uh, I think I got at the end to both satisfy that nerd part of me and that more, uh, let's say, open to the others part of me uh, around markets but I still wouldn't know, to who, you know how to buy apples in that market. Uh, okay, so the, I, I need to conclude, I want to conclude with th thanks. So let me start from the one on, on the right hand side. So that graph there, it's the 77 people I, I, I wrote papers with uh, along the years, I had 77 accounting. I've enjoyed working with all of them and I've learned from all of them, a special, um, mention amongst those 77 is for my students on the top right. Um, so I hope I, you don't wait a long time for short responses like that, okay? You'll tell me otherwise. Um, yeah, so we, thanks to, to my students, I've learned a lot. I, I've uh, been able to explore different ideas and uh, it's been, and it will be, I'm sure, pretty fun. And of course, I need to thank uh, the people on the left. Uh, so my uh, daughters and my wife who deal with me uh, and uh, it's not easy because I get often stressed about things I cannot control, which is stupid, I know. And uh, yeah, so in particular, I have to say in this dichotomy between the two streets and what I should do, I really have to thank my wife Lisa who already always pushed me to do what I thought was, what. Yeah, what was right for me. Okay, thanks a lot. I, I think it's time for, not questions, but. Okay. Um, hello, I'm Luke Moreau. I'm the head of the Department of Informatics. Um, I uh, have to deliver two votes of thanks and they need to be different. So that's, that's my challenge for tonight. Um, so I, I can't get that picture away from my brain of this little Carmine, 10 year old in his bedroom in his Forza Italia t-shirt and in his Commodore 64. <laughs> but um, I, I, I can't get uh, away from it. Um, we, we don't... Uh, Traditionally, for an inaugural lecture, we don't have questions, okay? However, the fundraising office has got a question. Given your title, algorithms meet money. 
have you met money? The fundraising is, would like a, a big donation. So when is it for? <laughs> um, <clears throat> So um, we were talking about uh, ChatGPT, and um, you know when Google came out, we, we were all Googling our names to see what it was like, okay? Well, of course, that's what we do with ChatGPT. So um, what did I do today? And I chat is it a verb? Uh, I chat gpt uh, um, uh, Carmine and also Elena. Um, and it's really interesting. Um, so you, you need to be a bit specific. I ask, who is Carmine Ventre at, at King's? Um, I'm sorry, but as an AI language model, I do not have access to personal information about individuals unless it is publicly available. However, I can tell you that King's is renowned for research, blah, blah, blah. Okay, good. Um, so I'm, I'm becoming a bit more specific. Who is computer scientist Carmine Ventre? Carmine Ventre is a computer scientist and academic researcher who specializes in the area of software engineering and formal methods. <laughs> and he is currently a senior lecturer associate professor in the Department of Informatics at King's. Um, prior, prior to joining King's, he was research fellow at the University of Leicester in the UK. <laughs> Uh, and uh, also, you were at the National Institute of Informatics in Japan and University of Bologna in Italy. Um, and your focus is on the development of software engineering techniques and tools for the analysis, verification, and so on of systems. So I wrote, I thought Carmine Ventre was an AI researcher. Could you double check? I apologize for the confusion in my previous response. You are correct that Carmine is not primarily known as a computer scientist. Instead, he's an AI researcher who specializes in the areas of machine learning and natural language processing. <laughs> uh, Carmine Ventre is currently a lecturer assistant professor in the Department of Informatics. So I thought I'm going to stop, otherwise I'm going to have Carmine in his bedroom at the age of, of 10. Um, no, let, let, let's be uh, serious. Um, it, these days is, is a special day in the life of, of a, a professor, okay? As, as an academic, we, we strive to become professor, and then that's part of the folklore to be able to, to deliver this lecture. So, Carmine, uh, my personal congratulation. Um, and I, I would like to, to, to thank you for this lecture and the clarity of, 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 of what you presented. Uh, and I'd like to, to you know, really congratulate you on, on your academic achievements. And, and also something that is not visible uh, to, to you all, to your contribution to the life of the department. It's something that is not externally visible, that's, uh, but that's something that, um, that I wanted to say. Um, and um, finally, I would like to, uh, to thank your collaborators, your um, students who, who are here, but also thank the family for their support. Because as you indicated, you've been spending nights worrying or thinking about problems, and they have been really important. So thank you for your support. Thank you. So, um, thank you, uh, Luke. So, uh, next up we have um, Elena, and um, I'm, I'm doing this very badly because I've lost my piece of paper. Um, so, Elena uh, Simpel, um, who is going to present uh, knowledge engineering from people to machines and back. So, thank you, Elena. <coughs> So, Carl, it is 5.37, yeah, so we're a bit late, think about that. Um, knowledge engineering from people to machines and back, uh, but before I get to that, um, let me, I'm going to tell you something about my academic journey in a, in a short while. Um, 
I haven't included anything about what happened before, and um, I think that's not right, certainly after you've seen little Carmine on the slides before. Um, so Carmine told us um, about how he became um, the academic that he is today. Um, say, when I was growing up, I was a mathematician. Um, hardcore math person. He was going to competitions every single year since the age of, since the age of eight. Um, and essentially, like in a tournament, I would go from the school level to city level to district all the way once to qualifying to international competitions. And sort of as I was finishing high school, I was fed up with it. It was very theoretical. Um, I didn't really see what application it would have in the real world, so I thought, I'm going to become an economist, and I'm going to work in banks. And this was sort of a year before I was finishing high school. And my parents were very busy with other things, um, but at some point my father heard about it, and he said, well, my father is a very special individual, but he said, no, no, my daughter is not going to become a banker. I said, I'm not going to do maths because, you know, I'm a bit bored. Right, so then he had a friend who said, why don't you become a computer scientist? I mean, this is the future. I said, I don't know nothing. I don't know anything about computer science. Oh, I'm going to teach you. So then we started with this friend of my father's who was teaching me Pascal, which is an old programming language, which is still used, by the way. So those of you who know it, you can still make a lot of money. Um, and I hated it. I really hated it. But then what happened was that I found out that um, the university I wanted to go to, because I had that math track record, they would just allow me to get in without an exam. And I thought, oh, well, that's good enough, right? So if we're, uh, to go and study economics, I would have had to do it. So I thought, all right, well, so be it, compute science. So this is where I am. Absolutely nothing in my background, in my DNA prepared me for this. But, you know, I stand here in front of you as a computer scientist talking about knowledge engineering from people to machines and back. And the other thing I want to say, um, and um, after Luke's expose of Carmine, it's quite evident, none of this is computer generated. This is all me. Good. So, knowledge engineering. Knowledge engineering is a engineering discipline. Yeah, so I'm an engineer by training. What does that mean? It means that as an engineer, I solve problems. And I do that by looking at requirements, by doing user research, by then coming up with some sort of solution, which I try to implement, and then I deploy it and evaluate it and maintain it. Because it's knowledge engineering, the sort of thing I built is a type of software, and it's a very special type of software. It is a type of AI called knowledge-based systems, yeah? Knowledge-based systems are a type of artificial intelligence um, that has been around for quite some time. Um, and essentially, the idea is that you um, draw the intelligence. Oh my god, hold on. There's torches on. Why is that? Let me just put this here. So, Knowledge-based systems. Um, the idea is that, that the system, the software, draws its intelligent behavior from capturing the knowledge of people in a digital or in a computational form to support decision making. Well, so here we go. A few examples. Um, we use this sort of knowledge-based AI all the time. We use it in every single search engine. We use it um, when we ask for recommendations on Netflix and when we um, go on Amazon to buy something and we receive product recommendations or when we talk to Siri on our phone. So here's an example to illustrate what I, what I mean. So I am searching on Google for my football team. And I receive not just websites that talk about this football team, I receive information specifically, specific information, facts about this particular entity, which I'm referring to as FC Bayern, which is a football club. So, this knowledge based system essentially knows that the sequence of letters, FC, blank, and so on and so forth, refers to an actual thing in the real world which I technically refer to as an entity, yeah? And this entity is a football club. 
It's not a university, it's not a hospital, it's not a train station, it's a football club. Then it also knows that football clubs tend to have a stadium and they have a manager. So then it is able to give me all these facts on the right-hand side. If I would have looked for King's College London, again, the knowledge base that sits behind this magic would have been able to tell me that that's probably a university and then it wouldn't have shown me any stadiums. So that's knowledge base systems in action. Think about, think about the knowledge base essentially as a very big Excel spreadsheet. And I know some of you here um, know a lot about knowledge bases and knowledge graphs, um, so don't be angry with me. Um, I'm just trying my best. So think about it as a big spreadsheet. In each row is a fact about, of in, about an entity of interest. So on one row it says, FC Bayern is a football club. The next row says, the football club is located in Munich, Germany. The next one it said, its stadium is called Allianz Arena. Part of that spreadsheet doesn't refer to actual things in the world, like the different football clubs, but has more general stuff about how football clubs operate. So it says, a football club tends to have a manager, it tends to have a stadium. There are many ways to structure these spreadsheets. And there's many ways to publish them in a way that other people who haven't designed that spreadsheet understand what they're about and can combine them with their own spreadsheets. But that's a lot of technical details that we don't really need to dwell on today. Think just big spreadsheet with facts about things of interest. Now, most large organizations in the world have their own proprietary knowledge base. There are also some open source ones. Um, and the example here is Wikidata, which is used, among others, on Wikipedia pages. So every time you go and look for an article about an entity of interest, in this case, still my football club, the information on the left, which is basically another way to display the content of the big spreadsheet, is read into that thing on the right, yeah? So that fact sheet. So you still have the text, but you also have specific information. Knowledge-based systems don't just contain information about current affairs. They tend to know a lot about background stuff, about sciences, about healthcare, about history, about geopolitics. And they can deliver not just answers to factual information, factual queries, but they can also give you, I don't know, mathematical proofs. Um, or uh, complex plans or optimizations, all because they have access to a knowledge base that contains all that information. An example of such things is this Wolfram Alpha system um, that is here on the slide. So now, you may wonder how all this relates to the sort of AI you've been reading about in the news, say, the sort of chat GPT or BARD of this world, so first and foremost, to just make a comparison, let's just forget about the chat part. Um, so the chat part is a way to interact with this sort of technologies, um, just like a search field in a Google search engine is one. So let's just talk about the GPT part. GPT is a machine learning system. So that's another type of AI. Knowledge-based systems draw their intelligence from a knowledge base that captures domain knowledge about a certain domain like healthcare or football. Machine learning systems like GPT don't bother with all this knowledge curation. They learn patterns, they teach themselves to learn patterns from raw data, specifically a lot of data. And you've seen it in action as well, right? So every time you have an autocomplete on your phone or in your email, is this sort of technology that, that, that is at play. So when I start a message with FC Bayern, it is more likely that the autocomplete will be FC Bayern won at the weekend, rather than FC Bayern launched a rocket in space. And that's because, not because the machine learning system actually understands, well, this is an entity and it's a football club, so, and then they play games, and the games are mostly at the weekend, None of that is actually happening, but it has seen lots of similar sentences, so it can suggest the same sort of templates 
when you write a message. So essentially, think about these machine learning systems as giant predictive text engines. Most AI solutions at play use both things. So all the search engines, all the chatbots, all the recommenders, they use both an artificial intelligence where the intelligent behavior is drawn from raw data, which is by comparison quite easy to get to, get access to and learn from, and curated knowledge from a knowledge base. All right, so do I wanna go through these examples? Yes, I actually wanna go through these examples because they show what happens if you do AI without the knowledge base. You can't really read that. So, so how do I use this? Why does this say big money? <laughs> I don't know if you can see. Uh, big money, okay, big money. How do I use you, like this? No. <gasps> what have I done? Ah, magic, okay, so don't do that. Don't do that, do this. Yes, right, very good. So, uh, I was told I can't move, but I will move a little bit. Um, Carl. So, what happens in, yes, no? What happens if I don't have any knowledge, but I just learn from data? Example at the bottom. This is uh, Bing GPT, as of yesterday. No, uh, it's okay. Um, so I'm asking, who won the Champions League against Real Madrid? Yeah, so those of you who know football, Real Madrid, 14 times Champions League winners, big deal. Um, but there are some teams who won against them at different stages in the competitions over the year. So then uh, the, the information that is delivered is correct. Um, it also gives me sources where this information comes from, which are actually legit. And then it actually gets a bit more adventurous and says, oh, here's news about Champions League winners against Real Madrid. And it's not entirely off because this guy, he did win a Champions League final against Real Madrid. And my colleague Albert, who sits there and nods, he says, yes, we did. Um, but this article has absolutely nothing to do with it. And this happens because of the lack of context which a knowledge base would give you. Then there's a few other issues. So at the top, this is just the regular chat GPT in OpenAI, so what do I do? I'm asking who won the Champions League last year. So some of you might have heard that chat GPT is trained only on data until 2021. So problem, if the data is out of date, the training data it learns from, then when I ask for last year, it's gonna say, well, for the 2021, 2020, 2021 seasons held so-and-so, um, um, Chelsea won, yeah? Okay, fine. Um, so, right, it doesn't know exactly what the time is and it has some issues with training data. But then, all I do, a minute later is I add a Z, I corrected myself because I'm a perfectionist, so instead of saying who won Champions League last year, I say who won the Champions League last year. Uh, and guess what happens? All of a sudden he's getting all confused, I apologize for my mistake earlier, it's saying exactly the same information in a, in a different way. So there is a brittleness in that, that that comes from the fact that essentially it is predicting text in an amazing way, but it is predicting text. Okay, so this is the area. Now I'm getting to what I've done. Um, my research journey started early 2000s. Um, so remember early 2000s, this was 2002, 2003. We didn't have any of the data and sort of computational infrastructure uh, that would allow us to do any chat GPT magic. It was an honest world of AI expert systems. So you would sit down with a domain expert, with a knowledge engineer, and you would build this knowledge-based AI that would capture people's expertise to answer questions, to reason, to support decisions. And the way to do that, at least in theory, would be to follow a fairly standard engineering process. So you start and you think about the problem, the opportunity, you look at economic feasibility, you do some requirements and domain analysis, then you build some sort of conceptual knowledge-based model on paper, typically, then you implement it so you enter it in a computer, you deploy it in an expert system, you maintain it, and so on. So, so, so this was how things were done. 
and their decades of experience and textbooks and papers and research telling you how to do this. So here I was. So I started this PhD in Berlin, 2003. This was a project where we wanted to build this medical su diagnostic support systems for lung pathologists at a big hospital in Berlin. My task was to build a knowledge base. So this was not easy. First, why wasn't it easy? Because it's medicine, right? So it's not even pathology, even lung pathology, complex domain, so it takes a lot of time to do this from scratch. At the same time, actually, there were close to 100 medical knowledge bases available. So in theory, all I had to do was to mix and match different bits and pieces from all these medical knowledge bases and create the one that would work for my application. So that's what I tried to do using the guidance and the methodology that I had at the time. It didn't work. Some of these knowledge bases were not available anymore. For some of them, I had to pay. For some of them, the documentation was really poor, so I would spend ages just looking at them and not really understanding what to use, when to use them. Some actually had been designed with very different use cases in mind than what I had to do, but that was never said explicitly. So it took a lot of time, it took a lot of dedication for me to find all that information. So my PhD wanted to solve this problem. So what I did was I started collecting all these different case studies in which one would attempt to reuse someone else's knowledge base, and I've analyzed them to understand common concerns, and then I came up with guidance on the one side for people who build these knowledge bases to document them better, to make them more reusable. On the other hand, to, for people who use them, to have step-by-step -step checklists and things to think about, um, so that this whole process is a bit faster than when I did it during my PhD. Now, while I was doing this, let me check the time. Oh, uh, while I was doing this, I realized, actually, do I have any understanding of the costs and benefits of this process? I mean, what, why would I put in all this effort to reuse someone else's knowledge base when it's so hard? And I realized at the time that we had very little information about how to do this. How much does it cost to build an actual knowledge base in practice? And I've started a piece of work where I proposed the statistical model with different cost factors that were empirically validated. Um, and I collected lots of actual information about how much it costed to build these knowledge engineering systems. And essentially, I was able to predict costs quite well, but the result was not great. The result was essentially, it's so expensive, no one will ever want to do it, unless you know they're a big company and can afford it. So then what do you do? Well, I had two options. One was to try to automate, but that wasn't an option at the time because the technology wasn't up for scratch. And the other one was to go away from this idea that you do knowledge engineering with a small group of people, experts trained in that field, and involve more people. So when you involve more people, there's a few things that, that you need to, to take into account. So you move away from a situation where you have a small group of experts, expensive, hard to train, um, but they're very knowledgeable, to a situation where you have hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of people who all can contribute some little bits, but they actually don't care so much about knowledge engineering. It's not their job to care about it. Um, and they're not trained in it. So they will make mistakes, and they will make different types of mistakes. So two issues. First, the data quality. But secondly, also, how do, you, how do I keep these people engaged, since actually it's not their job, and they don't have an intrinsic motivation to do it? So this brings me to my first project. So this was the first project I was a proper PI on. It was in 2009. Um, it was the first time I did interdisciplinary work, so not applied research with medics, but actually I worked with psychologists and economists and HGI researchers and game designers to, um, because I wanted to find a way essentially to design knowledge-based systems in a way that is not just compelling in general, but in a way that encourages any user of these systems to contribute, to make their little contribution to the knowledge base in, in the back end. And we've done many wonderful things, but I'm going to skip them because I'm out of time. Um, but I'm going to tell you about the main use cases that we had, the main scenarios that we've analyzed. One of them was with these people from a company called Telefonica. Um, so their problem was knowledge management. So think SharePoint. Um, so they were people in charge of the 
whatever version of uh, knowledge management system they were using, and they were a small team and couldn't build a knowledge base big enough, useful enough to improve how people were finding information. So what we did, what we could have done, is to reach out to everyone, Telefonica employees, we really need to improve our internet, go and do this. We didn't do that because we knew from psychologists and economists that it wouldn't work. Instead, what we've done is we started thinking about how do people use this internet and what are the little nudges and little things that they could do that would help us grow that knowledge base on the fringes. The other thing I've done is, um, so, okay, so in the first example, people, employees of this company, understood what their benefit was if they did this activity on the side. It was easy to do. They had a direct benefit, not just an institutional one, and we've given them some rewards. Another situation where people just tend to do a lot of stuff is games, particularly something called games with a purpose. Say, the most famous game with a purpose is Duolingo. Yeah, say, on the one hand side in Duolingo, um, what you do is you're training machine translation algorithms from two different languages, language that you learn and the base language. The examples that you have in Duolingo come from these algorithmic processes, and you, by learning the language, which is something you want to do, you help train an algorithm. So the idea here was to find the same sort of design patterns to do some knowledge work. The problem, though, was that this is more an art rather than a science, and for some knowledge engineering tasks, they're so dry and so complex that you can't easily come up with a, with a design. And then you also have the issue that you have to build a player base and keep them um, engaged. Finally, the other way you could do this grow a is to grow a community. So you have lots of examples of online communities that do great voluntary work, so OpenStreetMap, it's, how, it's, it's, it's a great example, Quora, Stack Overflow, Reddit. People do voluntary work if they feel engaged. Say, I started looking specifically at this system called Wikidata, which I've mentioned earlier. Um, so this is the, open, the largest open source knowledge graph available, um, and it has 26,000 contributors. Yeah? That's a lot, so that means you can get a lot of work done but you have some issues as well. On the one hand side, you still have issues with data quality because anyone can type in anything in that system. On the other hand, you do have issues with participation. You have 26,000 people, sure, but only 10% actually contribute regularly. And also you have, with large groups of people, you have all sorts of biases and groupthink and polarization that you need to account for. So we've done a number of number of studies to try to counteract some of these effects. So we've looked at um, how do we improve the quality of the data in Wikidata and its provenance. We actually try to understand how we can put together, bring together teams of editors in Wikidata to make the quality better. And we actually have data that shows that diversity in knowledge engineering teams leads to better results, which I was very happy about. We've also then started to think about gaps uh, and how we could manage those gaps. So what do I mean by that? When you let people work on whatever they want, you will have gaps. If you want to close that gaps, one way is to tell people what to do. You work on football. You work on cars. What happens then is that participation decreases. Like in academia, we have to work on whatever we want. If you want to counteract that, you need to sort of understand the principles behind it. So two years ago, I think, we came up with a method to try to understand whether these gaps that we notice in these communities are endogenous to the system, or if they're actually, they're just a reflection of what else happens in, in the world. I am almost close to finishing. Okay. Um, so I said earlier that automation was not an option, and it's true, it wasn't at the time, but we had something in between, just involving people and pure AI, and that was human computation. So this idea that you have a machine learning algorithm that needs lots of data to become better, 
And on the human side, you need to come up with these feedback loops to allow people to contribute a lot of data for a lot of period of time, and this data should be of good quality. And that's a project I finished two years ago, a large uh, research program, um, where we worked with public authorities and we essentially created this human in the loop system using online crowdsourcing, using citizens of the city, using um, various other sources of data from mobile phones to create much better training data about transport in this case um, for their transportation systems. Finally, this is where we are. So we are now at a stage where actually automation can do a lot. Um, even without a human computation element. That's more or less what I'm working on right now. So AI today needs lots of data, and if they want to be really smart, they also need lots of knowledge. So you need big knowledge bases, big spreadsheets. You can't do those manually, even if you involve lots of people. You need to use technology, technologies like, like GPT. Is that a bad idea? Not necessarily. So you can't read this, but basically here I've generated a small structure for a spreadsheet about football. And that sort of works. Um, I don't remember what I've done at the bottom. What did I do at the bottom? Yes. Um, there's many challenges there. So yes, you can generate some of this information quickly, but at the same time you still have the hallucinations that Luke talked about in his thank notes. So what I would like to do next, for the next five years, say, is try to understand how to use these technologies, which are very powerful, productively for knowledge engineering, to understand, going back to people, which tasks do really need human input anymore? Which tasks need human oversight because it's the law to have the human in the loop? And how to build tools that would allow little Elena in 2003 to have a much more fun experience during her uh, medical decision support project in Berlin. With that, um, yes, it's been a journey from people to machines and now back to people and possibly back to machines. Um, someone said to me once that people are the hardest thing in computer science. Um, I think people and machines together are actually even harder. So I'd like to thank with that all people who helped me in my career, not just family and friends, but my supervisor in Berlin, and all my line managers in um, Berlin, in Innsbruck, in Karlsruhe, in Southampton, and here. Uh, my mentors, my collaborators in the UK and in Europe. Um, uh, people who funded my research, because I have been given a lot of taxpayers' money. Um, and finally, all my staff and all my students from whom I've learned a lot and who really made me the academic who I am today. Thank you. Uh, me again, uh, clearly a football theme today. Uh, had I known, I would have put on a shirt, but I was. <laughs> uh, it, it's interesting to see the, the two journeys here. Uh, Elena starting with uh, Pascal. Uh, actually, yeah, it's also my first language. Uh, Carmine, Commodore 64. And, and what computing is allowing us to do now? and the problems that we are tackling now. is The journey is just amazing, and it's, it's impacting society so much, and it will keep on doing so. And, and we are really at, at the center of this. It's, it's fascinating. What is also fascinating is to see the breadth of research in, in AI in, in this department at King's. Um, what Carmine and Elena presented is, is very different in, in their research. Um, though there is some overlap, but these are sub-disciplines of AI. Um, what is also really fascinating is to see how Carmine is harnessing computing power to solve 
problems. And at least, Elena, in part of her research, is harnessing people in order to solve problems and improve data quality. So we, we're tackling all those issues. It's, it's really, really, really amazing. Um, going back to the good old chat GPT, of course, I looked at Elena, and, 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 and that's, that's what Elena said. The model was built in 2021. Um, so, who is Elena Simple from King's College London? There is no Elena Simple at King's College London. However, there is an Elena Simple who is Professor of Computer Science at the University of Southampton. And that's where I got to meet Elena uh, a few years ago. And um, I've always been very impressed by her energy and her drive and, and uh, really Try, how, how she's pushing initiatives forward. And I see that in, in the department as uh, she's acting as a, um, she's deputy head uh, enterprise and she's really driving amazing initiatives. So um, I, I'd like uh, first, Elena, to, to thank you for, for this very nice lecture. Um, and um, and also uh, uh, congratulate you for all those um, academic achievements. Um, you are really well established in your field and you are uh, really well known. Um, and as I said, um, in different way to come in there, but th th these are the things that, that are not visible externally, but the contribution to the department from my point of view is something um, really important. And you thanked everybody, uh, your collaborators, your funders, yes, very important, uh, but also I'd like specifically here to thank uh, Mike, your family who is present here because he's very important uh, and is supporting you. Thank you. Okay, so I want to add, add my thanks to uh, both uh, Carmine and Elena for, for a, a wonderful um, uh, two presentations uh, today. Um, as, as Luke uh, said earlier on, you know, the form of an inaugural lecture is that there, is, there aren't questions. Um, but, you know, Carmine, you, you present, uh, um, you gave a presentation with Greek temples and bananas and um, Willy Wonka. So, there have to be questions asked. Um, so um, that's one comment. And, and Elena, whenever I, I speak, whenever I go to a meeting where I'm about to speak, you always sidle up to me beforehand and go, Mark, I'm going to ask you a really difficult question. So I was really looking forward to the opportunity to ask you a really difficult question, but um, that's not the form. However, there is a reception. There are drinks, um, as I'm going to say, eat, drink, and be merry. Um, and we can ask lots of questions to both Elena and Carmine. But thank you very much for a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you.